back. Um, the 16th edition of the Future Awards Africa is here, and this year we're celebrating challengers and builders. Um, we have two guests here who are nominees this year, I believe. <laughs> Tunde Onakoya, who's a convener, chess and slums, and of course Dada Temito Peoglu, who are the best, who's a director and a filmmaker, I believe. Thanks for being here today. How are you guys doing? Congratulations. No, well, thank you. Were you where were you when you heard you were nominated? Uh, and in I what think, category? I think I got an email from, okay. from them um, for community action. So I was excited because, I mean, last year, um, I saw it, and I mean, it's, it's a very popular award, and uh, I just thought, uh, someday, so yeah. that someday was, is now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Were you surprised at this? I mean, you are doing great things. For those who don't know, you, um, th I think the name speaks for itself, Chess and Slums. Yeah. Uh, why did you start off with that, and how long have you done this for? Yeah, so there's a backstory, and uh, it, it kind of tells my own personal story, right? Uh, and thank you for not calling it chest in slum, because <laughs> I've heard so many Who different iterations of it. <laughs> you see, chess is slums, chess, but it's chess in slums Africa, right? So I started about like four years ago, in 2018, and uh, like I said, it tells my personal story. I grew up in a slum community in Korodo called the Salodo, and um, chess changed my life, right? Literally, and um, I mean, four years ago, I made the same decision to give other children like me the same opportunities I got through chess, and that is that was how it all started. And it has evolved into, you know, this revolutionary project that that is now changing lives. You know, so. Yeah. So I mean, we, we've seen a lot of your work online, and you know, a lot of the things you do. With um, at what point do you think things went sort of? I don't want to see, use the word blue, like who is doing it? When did you realize this thing had become a lot bigger than you are, you are working on? Okay, so it's a series of events, right? But very recently, the, the last project we did, but then a lot of things happened over time, right? And I mean, that's why it's important to always stay consistent, right? With whatever you're doing, because you just never know, right? I think the first time was when, sometime last year around me, that we did a project with Marco Cole, right? So we had, this tournament where a 10 year old boy with cerebral palsy won and he went to Pavara. Like, I was getting emails from people in other countries who were like really inspired by this boy's story. And uh, we had journalists travel all the way down from their countries from CNN, BBC. We had journalists from Portugal, from Germany come to Nigeria to come and cover our story. So that was when it really dawned on me that we were doing something truly phenomenal. Yeah. And, um, I, I quit my job then. It gave me the confidence to do that and say, okay, let you me just focus on this. I was a professional tutor, right? Okay. So I, I teach chess professionally, okay. right? So I used to do that. So it just it used to take up all my time because I had students in other countries, but I just knew that I had to do this. Like this is purpose. This was purpose for me, right? Mm -hmm. I'd known all along, but then it became clear that this could, if this project could become successful, it could mean that thousands of children, their stories would get rewritten. So. Nice. And let me come to you now, Dara. Um, first of all, congratulations. Did you get an email as well or did you get a phone call? Yeah, so I, I was driving to a shoot and I think I was on Todd Miller Bridge when I got the e email and I think I was playing a particular song that was in line with what was happening. So the joy was like, I didn't imagine it. Not this year, yeah. at least. I didn't imagine it to come this year. <laughs> yeah, because, why not? I mean, I just started directing, like, in the real sense of directing. Yeah. Well, you had kind so, of been in the industry. I've been in the industry for a long time. I've been a creative for a long time. But, like, I just started focusing on directing, like, in this... I think COVID, actually, was when I started focusing on directing. And yeah. in just this short while, I got a meal for... Yeah. An award I was never <laughs> expecting in the first place. Yeah, awesome stuff. Now, I think uh, your bio says something about you loving, having an unhealthy addiction to exploring new stories and interesting things. So what sort of stories? excite you? Because, I mean, Nollywood uh, is on a path now that's very exciting for a lot of people. Yeah, um, a lot of the streaming platforms are running in here. You know, we're seeing stories being told in a different way. Yeah. On the flip side, we also had the National Assembly talk about, you know, in the last week, how Nollywood <laughs> has influenced the youth in a very bad way, which is why ritual killings and things like that are suddenly exploding, you know. So how important are those stories to you? What kinds of stories, you know, excite you? Okay, so I'm a weird kind of director. A lot of directors enter industry maybe through a short film 
or through music videos. I don't do any of what. I just basically just focus on commercial for now. So, I mean, short stories are what I'm interested in, really short story and straight to the point. But I draw inspiration from a lot of things, and I, I want music videos and movies are like one of the major, like major source of my inspiration. Yeah. But I, I'm more interested in telling short stories, quick, straight to the point story. But I'm not also interested in selling products to your face. So if you check my works, most of them are like story based. They're not just um, this is this product come and buy. No, it's a how this project has transformed maybe the life or the movement. So. Those are like where I draw inspiration from, and that, that's like what I'm interested in telling right now. Like I said, I'm a creative. I evolve over, I've like I've evolved over the years from graphic design to photography to um, filming events to now directing. Yeah. And I believe that this is like still the early stage of my career. I still have like a long run to go. I've had few people send me scripts, short scripts, like come and try this out. But I think I know where I am, and, and I, like I know where I want to go. So I'm taking my time to. Master. I don't just want to jump into things I will just do for doing it. I want to do it because I know I'm ready to do it. So, I mean, big ups in Hollywood, like, obviously, it's going to get bigger. And I think this is the best time to be in, to be, to, to be honest. And I'm, I'm looking forward to exploring that. Like I said in my bio, I, I want to explore as much. I, I'm, no, I'm, not, I'm not a creative that can be caged and... Um, say this is what I'm I like. Yeah. I explore things from time to time. So tomorrow I might move away from being director to probably a producer and all that. But yeah. I, I'm still a creative in the yeah. long run. Just, long just to put you on the spot a bit, like when I was talking about what the National Assembly said, you know, there were people who started saying, you know, the NBC needs to ban certain sort of stories uh, being used uh, in films. Do you think there are some stories that should not be told? No, I think our creative. stories need to be told. The way we now tell them is what matters. And we cannot even categorize just say this is the only source of influence to what is happening. Like, you cannot say people are doing rituals because they watch film. That would be, to be honest, dumb to say. But the way we tell the story matters. And even if you check Nollywood, the end of the rituals that we've seen on Nollywood is not like it's, it's what will inspire you to go and do rituals. So I don't <laughs> know where that, story, where that narrative is coming from. So it's, yeah. our stories need to be told regardless. And anybody you ask will tell you, and I mean, this, a lot this of things, things predates Nigerian films anyway, <laughs> so it's not. But let me come back to you now. Why chess? Because it, it's quite a complex game board game, maybe not for you, but for a lot of people to understand, because why not Ludo or what or draft or checkers, which <laughs> other people call it? Why was chess the go-to? Yeah, and um, so there are two ways to explain this. I mean, there's a part where, you know, chess is a global touchstone of intellect, you know. Empirical research has proven that it aids cognition in so many ways. So for a child, it is an important educational resource to teach them not what to think but how to think for themselves right so there's that the mental benefits that it has right but then why chess in the context of this story right and this was the mindset behind starting out chess and slums because when you think about chess you think about the elite the elites the high intellectual people and all of that you don't think about it in the context of like a slum child because for a child in the slums you know for them it's just about survival so the mindset was teach them chess, let them gain mastery of it, right? And, you know, it would seem unreal when you say a child from the slums of Archimula is a chess master. You have to respect that child. You will look at that child differently, and that is a new identity. So that was it. Wanted to give them a new identity through chess to show that beyond the background, beyond what they look like, they have high intellectual capacity. You know, they have the capacity to do this that even some of the most intelligent people find difficult to learn. And this is just, you know, the story of every child, right? These children that we neglect in these vulnerable communities, they have incredible potential. Chess is just one way to highlight it. Now imagine if you give them education, imagine if you give them coding, imagine if you give them anything else, they will thrive, right? So chess is just, it's not the end in itself. It's a means to several ends. Through chess, some of the children we trained have gotten scholarships to go abroad. They've gotten so many amazing, incred incredible opportunities, right? So chess is the driver, right? And chess saved my life, so it was, it yeah. was the only thing I knew how to do. How many children yeah. have you had go through this program now, do you know? 
about 500 in Ikorodu, started out in Ikorodu, then to Makoko, then to Burkina Faso, Kaya, then now Oshidi on the bridge. Oh, nice. Yeah. And um, how many do you have currently? Or do they, is, there, is there a stream, yeah. like you say, if some have gone on to do have scholarships and all yeah. that? Like, so the way it runs is we have academies in this location. So we have okay. a chess academy in Ikorodu, we have one in Makoko, we have one currently in Oshidi, then we have one in Burkina Faso. So we create a database for all the children. So our program runs for like a year. So from very beginner level okay. to, to master level, right? So they go through that program. Then we leverage partnerships for other things, for healthcare, for... And because of the demographic of children we work with, you know, it's easy to empower an adult and just walk away. But you can't just empower children in some communities. Maybe just give them food for a day and take pictures of impact. You can't walk away. So there has to be a sustainability plan. So our sustainability plan for them is to give them an education. For the ones that probably cannot get an education, also give them other opportunities, right? That could be that would be useful to them. Yeah. Right. So that's how it works. Then we have tournaments for them, we give them exposure, events and, and all of that. Nice. Um with you now, I mean film is like I said, it's changing, you know. The streaming platforms are here, we're having all of this. People wake up and put things online, just <laughs> if it's on YouTube or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different um, industry from when it started. Um, do you find, so would you, I guess my question is, would you call yourself a Nollywood director or a creative director? And why, whichever one you call yourself, why is that important, if you know what I mean? Uh, so I think I'll call myself more of a creative director um, because I'm exploring stories, I'm exploring yeah. opportunities. I want to tell the Nigerian story, I want to tell the African story, but I can't tell a story I don't know. So at this stage of my career, I'm learning a lot, even as much as I'm putting out stuff. Is a, so t most of the works I've done, is a, there are stories I can relate to, there are stories I can tell from my perspective. Hence why I'm very careful with what the works I do. Like, I get a lot of inquiries. Well, maybe not a lot, but I get a number of inquiries. <laughs> and I'm selective of which project I'm on because I don't want to tell your story and tell it um, the way it is not supposed to be told. So I'll consider myself a creative director, but I want to tell stories from my own understanding. Yes, I'm looking. So which is one of the things I want to explore more is partnership. So if there's a story I don't fully grasp, I'm looking forward to like collaborating with other directors and say, OK, you understand this story more, but there's a twist I can bring to it. I probably can bring the creative aspects, the cinematography aspects, to make it a bit more uh, acceptable. Because I think we've always, we've always had stories in Nollywood, in Nigeria. There's, sto there's, there's a thousand and one stories to be told. But the way you tell it is what makes it maybe interesting to watch or even interesting to, to, to receive. Yeah. So the short answer is I'm a creative director um, and I'm looking forward to telling stories. Do you think um, the way the world is going, the movie industry as it, it's built is, I don't want to use the word under threat, but I mean, we've heard stories about how, um, how do I put it, television is killing film now. Streaming is killing cinemas because people want to sit at their home and watch a series as against going to see one blockbuster movie. So a lot of things are changing. There's also, you know, the talk about, you know, with the way the TikToks and the reels are going, it looks like attention spans are getting smaller and all of these big budgets might not necessarily be that important anymore. Do you think that's going to happen? No, I don't <laughs> think that's going to happen yet. It might eventually happen, but I don't think it's what will happen like in the next few years. They're still, even though the attention span is smaller, people still appreciate good stories. We still have, we still have films that are going to the cinema and everybody's talking about it. Yeah. Even though King of Boys, for example, is how many hours long, but people still talk about it. <laughs> it's not your regular film that is short. So we still have those films, even though we want to watch the quick uh, 15 seconds content. There's still a time, there's still a longing for this is long form content and we cannot take that away from the table. Yeah. So the world is evolving and so is film. I mean, before now, there are we sh short films on like film. But now with your memory card, you can shoot what you can shoot on film. You can shoot yeah. 8K and the likes. So they are like, the world is evolving and film is also evolving. And I think Nigeria, the space generally is also evolving alongside. So yeah. there's still going to be that longing for those contents. Great stuff. Today, um, I mean, we see what you do, and for a lot of us, it's clear that it's not very easy. 
But you also kind of make it look easy because you, you, you put up all these glossy pictures of just kids around yeah. the table, you know, and they are playing chess and it's like, oh, wow, he's doing something great. How hard is this? Or how hard has it been, you know, all these years? First of all, it's, it's not easy. <laughs> Maybe it seems, it looks easy now because, you know, when you've been doing something for four years, and someone, I mean, I get, I get a lot of messages. For context, I gained like almost 80,000 followers in just a couple of days, right? So a lot of people followed, a lot of people discovered this for the first time. But like I said, we've been doing it for four years. So, so they don't, don't see the fight. Yes, so think of it this way. For the past four years of my life, every waking day is me thinking about how I could be a better human, how I could be kinder, how I could do things differently to serve humanity. Just like the way you think about your craft, what you do, and how you can get better at it, is also the way I think about humanity, about understanding people, understanding their intimate struggles in a way that I could relate and be able to help. So with time, it has made me who I am. So that's why it seems easy to be able to do these things. Imagine one of the most dangerous ghettos in the world. In, in Lagos, Nigeria, being in a classroom to teach chess, it doesn't make any sense, right? You know, a lot of not a lot of people will be brave enough to want to do things like that. But then, before that, I've gone to Makoko and slept there for three days just because. And if you see Makoko, the largest floating slum in the world, it's not easy to even stay there. How much more live there? So I've done things like this over time. I've helped me build confident expectations. Right? Yeah. It's hard to be able to engage. Right? But then. Someone has to be brave enough to tell the story, to so make it easy for other people. We have something coming up now on the 26th. Um, the Canadian High Commission, they are coming to Australia on that bridge to play chess. Some of the sailors from you know, Canada, the captain, they're coming down to Australia on that bridge to sit down with children on the street to play chess, right? That is phenomenal, right? Yeah. But it didn't just start now. There's, there's been you know, times when it was extremely difficult, but now we're getting a lot of support now. It does seem easy now because people are starting to believe that it is truly possible to do great things from a small so place. Th the non-profit world, for a lot of people, they say it's, it's a landmine, you know, because you are doing great work. Um, it's not necessarily a nine to five or you're building a business. You're just doing humanitarian work. Yes. Um, I, they call it a landmine because <laughs> reputation is very key. At the point where Absolutely. anything goes wrong, it becomes, oh, wow. So that's what this was all about all along, especially with money. Does that worry you, or does that put more pressure on you, you know, to be a certain way or carry yourself a certain way and be sure that everything is done a certain way? Because yeah. whether you like it, people are waiting to say, aha, I knew it. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I mean, sometimes I just see some comments, and, you know, I remember one yeah. time I just tweeted something like, all I want is a great girl for Christmas. So we were like, oh, don't go and use charity money <laughs> <So Mary. laughs> to carry a good girl. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, these are, those are like the, the few ones, you know, exceptions. But it's like being a pastor, right? Imagine you are collecting all that money and these and you're living extravagant life. And, you know, people will start thinking it's just regular human behavior, right? So I try not to worry so much about those things because um, I think... When you decide to do work like this, then you've chosen to be vulnerable. You've chosen to put yourself out there. Look at Bill Gates. After everything that this guy has done to eradicate polio in Africa, he still gets a lot of AIDS, conspiracy theory. So I've come to terms with it that there would always be that criticism at some yeah. point. Maybe not now, right? Everyone is still like, but then I'm very prepared for when that happens. The most important thing is to stay true to myself, stay true to the course, you know, and make sure that you know, we can create the success story for so many children. That would always be priority. And even if it comes with some negativity and criticism sometimes, I know myself and integrity, you know, is, um, is key. Like it's something that when I had nothing, and now that it does seem like I have something, which is not my money, <laughs> right? But then it would always be, there would always be accountability to the people who give to this. And ultimately, it would we make it count in the lives of the children that we're advocating for. I mean, you have Paris Hilton in your corner, so. Yeah. <laughs> Would you want this friend? <laughs> well, we started a conversation. I've been toasting you. Uh -huh. So what started here? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what kind of conversation? You're trying to, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't reveal too much, but, you know, it's something you would definitely want. Yeah, some, yeah, these yeah, kind yeah. of stories you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, true. Yeah. And I love what you said about stories, because stories are important. Like, a lot of people do great work like this, but they never get this kind of visibility because they don't know how to articulate their stories properly. 
Right. I think that's yeah. one thing that helped us with our chess and stuff. Because people don't understand chess, but they understand humanity. They don't if you are saying the there's this just went to vertical you, you lose long story. <laughs> <laughs> right. But people understand how it relates with like humanity, right? Yeah. So and being able lives, to basically. bridge yeah. that, you know, has helped our stories get more visibility. Yeah. So he's a storyteller and I was telling him while we we're sitting there that we should work together on creating a new story. There's so many untold stories. The ones I share don't tell the full story. They don't yeah. capture yeah. the entire essence of the project. Nice. So it's important to work with people like him, you know, creatives like this, to be able to put out more, you know, perspectives, right, to the story and inspire people. You started here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Do you think you're going to win the future award? Do I think? <laughs> I <do. laughs> to be honest, I don't know. Why not? I mean, I'm sure you've seen the other people who are in the category. I've gone to look at their work. You'll be like, I'm really. pass this guy. Because I know them before now. Like, <laughs> okay. Like, so most, of people, kind of most of the people in that category are people I talk to. Like, Nora. Me and Nora have been chatting for like six years. Yeah. Know each other for like six years. So it's not like I don't know them. So, and their works are great too. So it's left to who else, whoever is deciding who will win, yeah. to be honest. What about you? I don't win. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be right. <laughs> but I don't oh, think no, what's sure. more important is, I think what's more important is the recognition, to be honest. Yeah, the, we that hear that. But I mean, like, winning is great. Come on. But I'm rooting for this guy, Flag Boy. I wish we we're not in the same category, but. Well, maybe. So you're already telling him sorry. <laughs> in advance. Well, good luck to both of you. The Future Awards, I think, is coming up in, I think, about a week yeah. uh, from now, next Sunday. So all the best. Uh, and all the best to all the nominees uh, of the Future Awards 2022. We're going to take a break now and be right back. Please stay with us. Hey, uh, hey, G, hey, e, uh.